Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> see if we can, is the mic okay? Can everybody hear me? Okay. I'd like to welcome everybody this evening to the September 2015 monthly WIP Town Hall meeting co sponsored by the Department of Energy and the City of Carlsbad and being broadcast live by Red Rocket Media. Mayor Dale Janway sends his regards that he is unable to uh, make it tonight. Uh, my name is Jay Jenkins, and I'm President and CEO of Carlsbad National Bank and past president of the Carlsbad Department of Development and a current member of the Mayor's Nuclear Task Force. I would like to recognize a few folks in the audience uh, this evening, uh, representing Congressman Steve Pierce's office, uh, Bernadette Granger. Thank you for being here. Uh, also, uh, Diane Ventura, representing Senator Heinrich. Thank you and also Dr. Martin Simon, representing the New Mexico Environmental uh, Department. Thank you for being here. Our discussion tonight is going to include an update on the WIP recovery activities by interim manager Dana Bryson, who will be retiring from the Department of Energy in a few months, and a special uh, presentation on radiation issues by Walter McMillan. Most of the questions we receive from our online participants are related to radiation issues, so we appreciate WIP's willingness to devote the time they have with this topic. As most of you know, the Department of Energy on August 31st announced the selection of Todd Schrader as manager of the Carlsbad Field Office. Mr. Schrader appears to have a good resume, and we look forward to working with him on WIP and WIP on the WIP recovery. However, we always hope for more opportunities to be directly involved in the selection process. I'm sorry that Mr. Schrader is unable to make it tonight, but I'm sure that he knows that this facility is a world-class answer to cleaning up the nation's nuclear waste. We look forward to meeting him and explaining that this is a community that is very supportive, but also has high standards. I'm sure we'll see Mr. Bryson around over the next few months, but we wish him well and wish him the best on his future endeavors, and we appreciate all of his efforts on behalf of this project. We will, of course, be taking questions on the WIP activities and on the radiation presentations afterwards. Please keep the questions civil and appropriate to the topics being addressed. Again, thank you for, for being here this evening. And at this time, I'll turn things over to our moderator, Tim Runyon. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for your remarks. Uh, glad to see everybody here tonight. And uh, I think we're going to launch right into the program. I think everybody will find it interesting. Uh, I hope so. As Jay indicated, we do get lots and lots of questions about radioactivity and contamination, and we have an expert here to, to help us out tonight uh, from the site who works with this every day, who, uh, who will be able to answer your questions, uh, both from the audience and online. So uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll start off with uh, uh, CBFO Acting Manager Dana Bryson. Thank you all for being here tonight. We'll start off with interim ventilation status. Uh, the repaired fans and filter units have been received at the site. Uh, the units uh, are sitting out ready to be installed on the pads that have been poured and are ready to accept them. In September, we're going to get power lined up to them and uh, began the ductwork installation. The supplemental ventilation system. Now, remember, the supplemental ventilation system is the clean system that we can use with mining. The interim is uh, beefing up the um, contaminated system. And so the supplemental system, the fan has been um, in place in the underground. I was there the other day and, and observed it. It's, it's installed. Uh, it's in the uh, South 90 drift, uh, which leads directly to the air shaft. And it will increase the overall ventilation capacity in the underground. So uh, we're currently at 60,000 cubic feet per minute. The interim ventilation will take us up to 114. And then the supplemental will take us up to a total of 180,000 cubic feet per minute. Ground control, of course, is one of our priorities. And to date, more than 3,500 bolts have been installed uh, 
to stabilize the back or the ceiling in the mine. The hybrid bolter, which is uh, diesel electric, uh, has been assembled in the underground and it's sitting there waiting. I, I saw that too. And, and we have the crews uh, that have been training on that and are ready to go. And so the last step is we need to get our portable power center uh, up and running and then they can finish their qualifications on the bolter and begin bolting with it, which the beauty of this is, so last week I, I went in with a crew that was bolting in the contaminated portion of the mine and they had to test to make sure they had sufficient airflow to run that diesel and to do that work. Well, with this, once it's moved into place, the electric portion of it fed from uh, kind of a big extension cord to the power center will allow them to bolt without running the diesel. So that, that will be a big improvement. The annual emergency exercise is coming up this month. Um, it's a simulated event. Uh, it will be graded. We have 16 outside agencies participating with us. We will be using uh, new software and communications, which will greatly enhance our ability to do this. And, and keep in mind that this is not our first drill. We, we have been doing numerous drills. Uh, we've done 80 drills since January. This will be the first full-scale exercise with our new emergency response procedures and systems. So uh, that, that will be uh, hopefully a validation of the planning and hard work that's gone into our emergency uh, response process. And now I'll turn it over to Walt. Um, Walt is in charge of radiological controls and dosimetry. Uh, he has been working the past year to upgrade all of our systems and um, We've, we've really got uh, a great uh, process and people involved with this, and, and so you can hear it directly from Walt. Good afternoon. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to go over some radiation basics and then answer questions. I know there's a lot of questions out there. Uh, again, my name is Walter McMillan. I'm, I've been here since March, 30, March 31st of 2014, right after the event, and uh, it's been... Uh, fast-paced learning experience, but we have a good team out there, so you should be proud of uh, what we're doing out there and your, your neighbors and, and co-workers. Uh, we're going to, I'll briefly go over uh, the different types of radiation. So radiation, basically energy released from an unstable isotope. Uh, ionizing radiation is typically produced by unstable atoms um, because they have an excess of energy or mass and uh, all molecules and atoms want to get down to their ground state so they want to give off this excess energy. Um, light, radio waves, microwaves are different types of radiation that are non-ionizing. Uh, the four types of ionizing radiation are alpha, beta, gamma, and neutron. Um, this graphic shows the relative penetrating power, power of these uh, types of radiation. So you'll see the top is alpha, typically stopped by a thin sheet of paper. Um, again, uh, Amerison 241, Plutonium 239 are primary isotopes of concern from the event, and they are alpha emitters. And again, alpha is typically, it can't get through your skin, so it's only a hazard if it, it's internal, if we inhale it, ingest it, or if it gets injected. We'll go over that later. Uh, again, the second would be uh, a beta. We do have uh, minimal beta radiation associated with Amerison and Plutonium, stopped by thin metal. Uh, we look at gamma rays. They're highly penetrating, but they are shielded by uh, high Z materials such as lead or iron. And then the bottom shows a uh, neutron, which is typically uh, shielded with a hydrogenous material, water, poly, that type of thing. Um, talk about background radiation. Uh, we're all exposed to uh, background radiation in our daily life. Uh, the average American gets about 620 millirem per year from uh, both medical and uh, natural uh, radiation sources. Radon gives us about 200 millirem, so um, eating, eating bananas gives you 
potassium 40. So uh, we get about 620 milligrams just living. If you live in high elevations, you get more. There's some areas in the country or in the world where uh, the beaches, they get over one R a year. Uh, we'll talk about exposure pathways for alpha, since that is our primary hazard, and uh, this is what we try to mitigate and protect from. Um, inhalation is materials that enter the body in, in the air that you breathe. Ingestion is materials that enter the body through the mouth. Uh, it could also be breathed in through your um, nose and mouth and then be caught in the mucus and then you ingest it that way. And we have absorption um, if it enters through intact skin, which is highly unlikely with uh, alpha. That's more of a tritium issue. Uh, we, have, we can also have entry through wounds. And uh, in the industry, we've seen a lot of uh, hazardous events where we've had pen punctures and penetrations of high alpha. Um, so that we guard against that with our PPE. So the way we protect employees is our PPE. Um, we have uh, powered air purifying respirators that the guys wear. Um, afterwards, you guys feel free to come up. I'll turn this on. You can handle them and look at them. But basically, it's a, a PAPR motor. It has two filters that draw the air in through the filters, and then it's supplied to the positive pressure to the face. Um, we have our PPE here that the guys typically wear. This is Orex. It's a, like a Tyvek type material. We have rubber gloves, rubber booties, and we have hoods, and booties all made of this Orex material. And again, uh, as alpha is typically an in inhalation, an internal hazard, we, uh, we try to protect the entire body and, and their breathing zone. Um, some of our safety management programs, including mine specifically, uh, they include training and job qualifications, uh, the administrative portion signs, warning barriers. We have job specific procedures. Uh, we're big on uh, JHA's job hazard analysis out there. Um, work control authorization, nothing happens without the facility shift manager authorizing it every day. Um, again, another part of my department dosimetry. This is how we monitor and uh, uh, ensure that we keep track of any potential dose that the employees receive and uh, shielding if, if necessary. So our internal dosimetry program uh, consists of three major elements, bioassay monitoring, air monitoring, and an evaluation pro program. So we don't uh, measure internal doses directly. Uh, we're gonna infer them from measurements of the radionuclides in the body. Um, either in, as you see there, that's the CMARC uh, whole body counter, lung counter. Is Russ? Russell isn't here, but uh, we, we are very lucky to have uh, a whole body counter this close. Uh, there aren't that many of them, and to have one in Carlsbad is a big plus for us. Right. So that's, we would go and get direct uh, measurement of the gamma uh, constituent of any uh, internal isotope. We do uh, radionuclides excreted from the body. We do urine and fecal analyses. And uh, we do workspace monitoring to monitor the concentration of uh, radionuclides in our environment. So uh, knock on wood to date, uh, our program uh, has worked and uh, no workers have received any recordable radio radiation dose as a result of our recovery activities. So I've got a good team. Uh, the whole WIP site has improved their rad worker uh, skills uh, a lot through training and the guys are very willing to learn. So uh, kudos to the team. Uh, radiological monitoring. So we do uh, initial qualitative surveys and sampling when we first entered the mine to identify the source and the extent of contamination. As you know, uh, right after the event, we conservatively posted the entire mine, uh, airborne area and high contamination area. And then we, we in, in a step manner, we went and recovered uh, portions of the mine through sampling and analysis. Um, then once we get down there, we do additional quantitative surveys to determine uh, PPE requirements and uh, posting levels. Um, our ongoing RAD support is focused on uh, risk remediation, contamination control, uh, support of operations. Uh, the, one of the big things we're doing is uh, regaining the safety envelope of the mine through the bolting that Dana was speaking about, ground control and the combustible controls. And uh, we're downposting, we're, we're doing more analysis and trying to downpost areas to remove the uh, or reduce the level of PPE that reduces heat stress and allows uh, more efficient work. 
Some of the instrumentation I use uh, or we use in the, in the field are continuous air monitors. I have uh, blade works over here. What that does, uh, air is drawn. I don't want to turn it on because in, in case I'm not, number one, I'm not qualified to work it and if it alarmed, I thought we'd have to evacuate the room. So anyway, air is drawn through and across the filter and, a, and a, there's a detector that does a continuous read of, of the filter. And uh, it divides the activity by the volume of air that goes across it and, and reads out in DAC hour. Um, it gives visual. That screen will show you exactly what the DAC hour reading is. And it, uh, if it hits a predetermined or preset alarm value, um, the, lights, the red light will come on and it'll make an audible alarm. And that's when we know to retreat. We've set our RWPs up. Our radioactive work permits is what everybody works to in the, in the radiological areas of the mine. We set suspension guidelines. And one of them is going to be based on uh, the level, the alarm level we set. And that, in turn, is based on the PPE and protective uh, clothing and the, the, the protective factor of your respiratory protection. Um, our, my guy's right hand is this, the 2360. This is the, uh, the dual phosphor scintillator. It's the measurable of alpha and beta. Alpha and beta. It measures both alpha and beta contamination. Um, so we can do, as you see, when they come out of the area, our, our guys are doing a direct frisk on them to make sure they didn't get any contamination on them in the area. We also can do direct frisks on surfaces. Or we can do a smear survey where we have a 47 millimeter square uh, paper disc uh, that you do a 100 square centimeter swipe on a, a material. You can count it on that. Or in the bottom corner, we have the uh, 3030, which is a scaler, which uh, counts, counts the smear and gives us a readout in, in uh, DPM, or disintegrations per minute. So we'll go over some of our postings. Uh, we have controlled areas, radiological buffer areas, contamination areas, high contamination areas, and airborne radioactivity areas. And on some of the Next slides, we'll talk about levels that are included in each in each area. So this is July of 2014. Uh, we had just started entering the mine. The first days after, well, the first days we went in in the beginning of April, we actually just sent down air monitor equipment on the uh, salt hoist by itself with no personnel, sent it down to the bottom, and then brought it up to see what the levels were. There was no... Uh, Detecting detectable uh, contamination or airborne radiation. So then we dressed people out conservatively, sent people down the underground, and started to proceed in a uh, controlled manner, uh, characterizing the mine. So as you can see, um, I'll, look, I'll show this way. So the north end of the mine, at that point, we had cleared it uh, to an RBA level, with, which meant it was a uh, radiologic buffer. You go in street clothes, but you, we required a rad contact to go with you in case there was any. Uh, areas that we hadn't previously surveyed. The green was a uh, down to an RBA. Again, you didn't need RADCON with you because we had surveyed that area uh, well enough. And then we still hadn't actually <coughs> characterized the uh, south end of the mine at that point. Um, fast forward to December of 2014. As you can see, the brown area here, the gold area, that is a uh, controlled area. A controlled area, basically, there are no radiological controls. It's, you can eat, drink. The guys can start bringing their lunch down, uh, eating it. Um, it's just like being in here. Um, so we dropped that to controlled area. You see panel 8 was still a uh, radiological buffer area at that point. We had the purple was areas that uh, CBFO had decided uh, we need to be restricted from because, number one, we either didn't have enough ground control in that area or we had to characterize it adequately enough or the contamination levels were so high we wanted to make sure we had the proper controls. The red, of course, is a high contamination area, airborne radio radioactivity area. You would wear two sets of this PPE and this PAPR to go in there. Um, just last month, and I know it's hard to see. I'm sorry we instituted a new color here. So what we've done, I think you've heard about the yellow brick road, but what we've done is, in order to uh, facilitate loading waste into panel seven uh, in the East 140 drift from 1950 to 2520, we laid down a layer of brass 
and then about six to eight inches of salt, and then made the turn down 2520 right to West 170 to the panel seven entrance. So that, and then we dropped that to a uh, radiological buffer area so you can walk in there and street clothes. It required us to do some gratis work and painting of the overcast at 2180, but uh, the guys did a wonderful job. We got adequate surveys, so now this is, you can walk in street clothes all the way to the entrance of panel seven and look down, you can see the closure down there. Um, we've also dropped to a contamination area with no respiratory protection required in West 30 and in the small section of West 170 right now. Um, again, I'm waiting to do the overcast at 2180 and West 30, the uh, same methodology that we used in East 140. And then this will turn into an RBA here. And we're going to lay Braddus and Salt 40 feet either side of the 2520 entrance to panel 7. So we'll bring our transporter of waste in, make the turn, and they'll turn here back up, and then we'll have a contaminated piece of equipment offload the waste. So we're, we're able to load waste uh, without, with only one transfer. Um, the red area is still high contamination. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm painting the wrong, we're pointing the wrong way. Still uh, high contamination airborne radioactivity area. We have uh, 160 items in, this, in these rooms that we've had the individual survey. We'll be dispositioning them in the, in the room six and room one. And once that's done, very rapidly, I'll be able to downpost this to a, it'll be blue, it'll be a CAARA. Uh, we're still gonna maintain the exhaust drift as a HAARA at this point until we do some more decom. Oh, and again, the, the, the legend down here, I don't know if you can see it, this delineates the uh, 10 CFR 835 limits for posting. Radiological buffer area, again, is less than 20 dpm per square centimeters alpha removable. Um, less than 200 dpm per square centimeters uh, beta removable. A contaminated air would be between 20 and 2,000. And uh, high contamination air would be anything over 2,000 dpm per square centimeters alpha removable. Airborne areas are typically posted at 0.3 DAC. And you can see some other levels in there we can get into later if you have questions. So uh, for radiological risk reduction, we're going to continue to try to reduce not only the CAARA footprint, but the uh, HCA footprint. We're going to try to uh, do a, a risk-based approach and get some good data so we're comfortable reducing PPE. And we're going to support recovery activities because that's what we're here for, again, to uh, recover the safety envelope of the mine through the bolting, which is every day. At least we try to keep two bolters running. We now have the, the third that we can run um, and support all the recovery activities. So that was quick. So uh, I guess it's time for oh, questions and answers. Yeah, we'll go ahead and, and uh, get started with questions. I forgot to mention to everybody, I hope everybody's paying close attention because we do have a little quiz. It's pass fails, but and if you no. pass, you can come work for me as a rec. <laughs> no, uh, uh, thanks, Walt. Um, uh, we will open up open it up for questions. I did want to mention, you know, Walt touched on the different PPE. If everybody gets a chance, if you if you haven't seen it before, if you haven't used it before, if you get a chance to come up and, and feel the weight of the PPE, feel what it's you know what it's made out of, and then imagine everything that you just felt. You have to wear two pairs of. Uh, it, it really, uh, it really does. You know, although you may get used to it after a while, it really does slow down the work progress when you have to be uh, engaged um, and wearing this sort of thing every day. Oh, uh oh! And imagine doing all your work when you're talking to each other like this and screaming above the airflow. This is daily life for those guys that are down there bolting and working in the contaminated area. And Dana gets a lot of respect because Dana was, like, like he said last week, Dana was down in the area dressed out in a respirator and PPE right down with the guys doing the bolting. So uh, he gets a lot of respect for that. So we're going to miss you, Dana. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and start um, and see if we have any questions, uh, in-house questions. Start with questions. Evening. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Well, okay, Lauren. In, in order to get on the on the in order for everybody to hear you on the video, we'll we'll uh, have you talk to the mic. Uh, pardon my ignorance if this is something that you already covered, but um, could you explain the airborne radiation? Because I thought I understood that alpha particles were quite heavy, 
sort of fell to the ground or weren't necessarily airborne? Is it an so, issue of scuffing up? Is it what makes it that area an airborne? So uh, remember, alpha particle is nothing more than a helium atom with no electrons. So it's two neutrons, two protons. So it is light. It's heavier than beta particles, but it, it is light. But what it does is attach to the salt, the salt particle. So um, thus, the deposition um, on the map when, when they had the when we had the event. You can see a, a definite gradient. It, 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 the highest levels of contamination are at the exit of panel seven, and it drops as you go uh, to up 2180 and make the turn east 300 to the exhaust. So uh, it, it binds to the salt particles, and that's where you get the heaviness in it. And it mostly played it out on the ground. We're finding very little on the uh, on the back and on the ribs. Are you still airborne? It is airborne. It does go airborne, and that's okay. yeah because if you get a chance to come in the mine, you'll see uh, salt particles are everywhere. So salt is very, it, it, the uh, particle size ranges from sub-micron up to, you know, 100 microns. So there's a, a large distribution. Yeah. So there are some small particles that stay airborne, yes. Okay, thanks, Lauren. Norbert. You uh, mentioned reportable radiation dose, and then several times you mentioned risk. You talked about risk remediation, you talked about continuing to reduce the risk to workers, and then also that you're taking a risk-based approach. However, risk is associated with a dose, and dose is expressed in rem, millirem, or sievert, or millisievert. And you didn't mention anything about that at all. You mentioned DAC, and you mentioned DPM. That's not dose, and that has nothing to do with risk. So, can you tell us, when you talk about reducing the risk to workers and taking a risk-based risk approach, by how much, by what kind of a factor, are you act, have you actually reduced risk since these incidents for workers underground? And please do that in the context of the fact that we advertised WIP to scientists that did non-waste disposal related experiments before these incidents, and it was actually based on, uh, on surveys underground, that the underground had naturally already a background dose that was only either 7 or up to about 18% of the natural background up on the surface. So can you tell us what is the risk to people underground or what would be the risk to the people underground if they did not wear all this stuff? Okay, that's a, I'm trying to remember all that. <laughs> but, so Norbert, uh, to answer your question. Uh, 10 CFR 835 has what we call an alley, annual limit on intake. Each radionuclide has its own uh, value. And what an alley is, is that amount of that radionuclide that will give you 5,000 millirem in a year if taken internally. So we use DAC, derived air concentration, is basically the alley divided by the amount of air a person breathes in a year. This instrument reads out in DAC hour. A DAC hour is basically equivalent to 2.5 millirem per hour. If you get one DAC hour, we say you basically potentially could have received 2.5 millirem per hour. Um, and again, you know, we don't assign dose based on our air sampling or our CAM readings. Um, we assign dose based on bioassay data. So that's the way you, uh, uh, airborne radiation would be, it, that's the way airborne radiation would be uh, related back to uh, a dose rate. So I, I just want to clarify something here. So I go in the mine and I work in a contamination area, an airborne area. And if the uh, airborne is one DAC and I work for a year, the radiation dose that I would take from ingesting, from, from breathing that, would be equivalent to five REM for that year. That's right. That's correct. So that's how we equivocate um, airborne radioactivity to a, a dose. And again, uh, we don't assign dose based on this. This is just a driver. It either drives the bioassay. And our program, if you wear a respirator, 
you automatically get bioassayed every quarter. Um, even if you don't wear a respirator, we take a certain percentage every quarter and, and bioassay you. Um, Norbert, was there any, anything I didn't answer related to that? It was a somewhat bureaucratic answer. Basically, you are basing everything on regulations. And you, you still didn't say what is the actual risk, what was the risk right after the accidents. And as a result of spending, what, your budget was increased by $104 million, I believe, last year. As a result of those $100 million, I think the educated public and I'm a member of that, I would like to know how much risk reduction quantitatively expressed did I get during the past year for those hundred million dollars that you, you took right, off, right out of my and everybody else's back pocket. How much risk w was reduced? How many fewer cancers will we have as a result of all your effort and how many fewer deaths or longer lifetimes will we have as a result of that? Unless you can put some kind of number to that, it doesn't, ha it doesn't really mean anything. So I, I see you're a proponent of you don't believe in the linear threshold theory. I, I, can, I can see that. So, but the regulations that we worked through, and uh, NWP embraces the Department of Energy's uh, safety culture and safety conscious work environment, the overriding priority is safety of the workers, the public, and the environment. So. Um, even though, you, as you know, last year we had some exposed individuals from the event. All of them had less than a reportable dose of 10 millirem, but there was mass hysteria, right? So we are not going to expose people on purpose to radio, radio, radioactive doses, um, it, it, and when we don't need to. We have PPE to protect the workers. We use engineering controls. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So, well, just just a clarifying question, based based on Dana's uh, calculation that he took us through, one one DAC hour, if you were in that without any PPE for a year, you'd get five rem. So after the events, we we had some pretty high DAC readings, I believe, DAC hour readings. Could we, you we could did. you just remind us what those DAC hour readings were? Yes, yeah, I mean, we had some in this 2180 drift, 300 to 600 DAC hour. All right, so, so, so 600 DAC hour times 5 rim would put us at 30,000 rim, which is... If they were working in it the whole year. Uh, so, yeah, to there's... be lethal there, doses. I wouldn't say lethal doses, but I would say significant doses. Um, okay. So... And then what are we today? On average, we're getting... We're not getting... Knock on wood, right, we haven't had any reportable, recordable dose. No, I'm talking DAC hours. What, what kind oh. of DAC hour readings are we getting today? In, in the program? in the general areas, we're getting 6 to 10 at the most. If we're in the 2180 drift, though, we can still get up to... So, so about 100 times reduction from where we were. Yes, sir. Based on our efforts, we've reduced the risk about 100 times based on the DAC hour calculations. Yes, sir. But we'd still, at the rates we're at, 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 let's say it's 10, we'd still be getting on the order of 50 rim in a year if we had folks in there unprotected. Sure, yeah, yeah. and that, at the Alara principles, and we worked at 10 CFR 835 DO order 458.1, so we would never send people unprotected in and knowingly give them dose when we could protect them. Thanks, Jim. We're going uh, to go to the Internet for some questions now. Uh, just to let everybody in the physical audience know, we've had between 10 and 15 participants online um, throughout the evening. Um, we've had several questions emailed to prior today and then a, a, a several asked right now, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, and Tim, if you want to dissect this in a little bit, the alpha readings have been given in the past when management has spoken, but since gamma and beta, beta radiation is also very damaging to health, these readings are pertinent to the safety of workers as well. What other readings in DPM of alpha, beta, and gamma in the contaminated and clean areas? Um, so the part of the question is to go a little bit more on, on beta and gamma. I, I think Walt can address that one. <laughs> yeah, so again, uh, the, the primary isotopes of concern are americium-241 and plutonium-239, which are alpha emitters. Uh, there's minimal uh, beta contamination um, in, in, in the underground. So that's why we, we don't, we typically, give you guys uh, readings in, in alpha because that is the primary isotope of concern. 
it creates the largest uh, hazard internally. Gamma dose, uh, Ameritrin 241 gives off a soft gamma, about 59.5 keV. Um, there's background, as, as Norbert said, the radiation in the underground is still background. Uh, the only time you're going to get any gamma dose is as you approach uh, a waste array in the underground. So the deposition of americium from the event hasn't caused any increase in gamma background dose rate in the underground. So, so basically it would be uh, it would be too low to measure. Uh, this is a two-part question. Um, at what normal distance is the probe of the survey instrument from the survey being surveyed? And the second part is, is the instrument, parentheses, scalar and probe, calibrated or field checked to the same distance? Right. So uh, they are, the, the probe and the instrument are calibrated together. For alpha, you survey at a quarter of an inch from the surface. So. We do our surveys a quarter of an inch from the surface. They are calibrated and uh, source checked every day. They're calibrated annually, source checked every day in that same geometry and configuration. And they are calibrated together as a unit. Okay, and I have more questions from those two individuals, but I want to try to get some from some other people. Uh, there was a question about um, New Mexico State University, Mr. Dr. Hardy, his program on internal dosimetry versus what's, what was it explained today? Could somebody possibly explain the, the two different roles there? Take it. I, uh, Dr. Hardy's program at uh, uh, the university here is part of the bioassay program uh, that we use, and it's, it's available for uh, WIP employees, but it's also available for the general public. And uh, if Russell was here, he could explain in a lot more detail. Uh, but, but they participate and they are part of our program. Yeah, so our, part of our routine bioassay program, uh, we send a certain percentage not only to do a urine, a urine urinalysis, we also send them to get the lung count at the, uh, and, uh, and again, it's open to the public. I think they're, they're more than welcome. Uh, so you just make an appointment and go there and get a little bit of sleep because it, it takes a little while. So. Um, Mr. Runyon and, and everybody else, this is one that, that has come up every every town hall, I think, for the probably the last months, a uh, few months, and uh, we've talked about ways to address this, but the question is, for, for what reason does NWP refuse to release the underground survey data by date, location, and instrument used in the underground subsequent to the February 2014 release? So, so basically, we, we take thousands of surveys in a year. Um, the purpose of these summary maps that we show you is that's how we consolidate all that data. And when you look at these consolidated maps, the legend tells you what the, do what the contamination levels would be in each posted area. So um, I don't know why anybody would want to look at a survey of an electric skid or of a, a, a pump. Um, it, 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 I don't think it gives any value added. I think what people want to know is where are we in our, in our recovery of the mine? Have we characterized it adequately? Um, are, we, are we making progress and, 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 and are we protecting the workers? And that's why I think these summer maps um, give adequate information. I mean, and that, that's our policy and uh, I think the Department of Energy uh, agrees with that. No, I think, uh, I think Walt covered that. I can't remember if I got this in one of my earlier questions. There was a request that information be given in DPM, and so I'll just read that into the record. Uh, the next question is, how are procedural or RAD violations reported and tracked in WIP, and where those are published? So typically, uh, we have a WIP form process. It's not really in my uh, swim lane, but we do have a WIP form process if we have when there are any issues at, at WIP. Um, procedure violation would be one of those, but there could be any number of process improvements that go into a WIP form. So we do have a, uh, a, an, an improvement process and a, and a corrective action program. I don't know, anybody want to elaborate on that? Mary, do you have a question? You look like you have a question. First of all, I would like to get those new maps and all I can ever find on the WIP site is that old map that's been on there for I don't know how long, contamination map. Well, I'd like to have that one. Oh, you'd like to have it? <laughs> so, is this available to? Uh, yeah. Those are probably already on the website right now. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, 
I had a question about what is in the barrels, uh, contaminated, radioactive, or radioactive, contaminated, or such as the, uh, now I've lost my train of thought here, okay. <laughs> nitrate salts. Are they radioactive, or are they just, you know, how are, there's a certain amount of things in these barrels, and some of them have to be more dangerous than others. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I, I think I was remiss. I didn't speak to a contamination. So contamination is just radioactive material in an unwanted location, right? Um, so when, the, when we have all the lanol or Idaho material in a drum, that's where we want it. When it gets out, it's contamination. So contamination is just radioactive material in an unwanted location. So there's, there's not a difference, so, right? It's radioactive. Um, as far as you want to know the constituent, we have a, a lot of different waste streams at, at the WIP. Um, I'm probably not the expert on it. This waste stream that we're talking about that we had the issue with is nitrate salts. Um, and the drum that uh, deflagrated had 92% americin-241, about 7% plutonium-239, 78% plutonium-239. So um, I might not be the right guy to ask as far as constituents of uh, all the drums in, in the underground, but we do have a characterization program. And can you tell me if there had been people in the underground at the time of this incident, where would they have gotten the highest dose and would it have been deadly? Okay, so if we had had people in the underground, um, again, remember the, uh, the Pound seven, room seven. Here, here's where the drum was that uh, deflagrated. We have uh, cams. We have the, we have the radio scam connects right here. So as soon as we had an issue at the rate of flow back then, it wouldn't take long for us to get a cam alarm right there. So we would immediately got a cam alarm, and people would have done the normal egress out of the uh, out of the underground. We typically don't have people in the exhaust drift. But you want, you want to put a hypothetical, if, if there's a cam alarm, people are going to exit, exit the underground. So uh, I, I, don't, we, we could, I could hypothesize how long it would take them, 30 seconds, a minute to get out of the drift. But uh, there would be, it wouldn't be deadly dose. No. Yeah, sorry. And, and Mary, that question's kind of near and dear to my heart because I was getting ready to go down that morning. But. As any nuclear facility I've worked in over the last 30 some years, when you hear a cam alarm, you exit that airspace. In, in WIP, you hear a cam alarm, you get out of that airflow. And, and so that's what protects you. And, and that's our procedure right now. That's what this is all about. When you see that strobe light, when you hear that, that alarm, you know you need to get out of the area. So yeah, uh, there would there would be no chance of uh, any any deadly dose. I would say I'm not going to hypothesize what you would have got, but it wouldn't have been uh, harmful to you, as Norbert would say, at those low doses. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, you may. Um, in the past year, uh, I know that there's been a lot of training with all of the, the you know, using the, the new PPE. Has there been any issue over the past year, um, a wardrobe malfunction or something not going right? Um, sorry for that. Uh, no, but honestly, has there, has there been any issue where a worker has needed to be tested because of a, um, a possible exposure despite um, using the gear? So yes, uh, we have had actually one incident that happened uh, when we were laying my uh, yellow brick road uh, the gentleman was kneeling and twisting and kneeling and twisting a lot and when we come out of the high contamination area typically we'll get you out of your outer set and we'll wipe down your PPE and when we were wiping down his PPE uh, this interface here had, had got, come loose and it pulled away for a couple seconds second or two and the rat contact put it right back on but because there was a possibility we we did send him for bioassay, and uh, the results came back negative. But PPE malfunctions do happen in the industry. I'm sure there's lessons learned all over. But that's the only one that I can think of uh, right right now. Sometimes uh, 
So we get low batteries, but we can we typically bring a battery with us so we can change it. If a battery uh, dies, if the battery goes dead when you're in the area, um, you typically under battery power, powered air purifying respirator has a thousand protection factor, so it reduces the concentration by a, a thousand. Um, if there's no powered air, if the power goes off, you still get 50. You still have a protection factor of 50. It's harder to breathe. But in the old days when I first started, that's all we had was uh, negative pressure. The, the mass had cartridges right on it. So you don't need that to be running to be able to breathe. It's harder. You just have to suck. And that's that's why and that I'm, exhausts you after a shift. So that's why it's really nice to have that motor working. Right, and and, and the, the increased protection factor is uh, is what we're looking for. We'd like to have a thousand protection factor rather than just the fifty. So if the battery goes dead and they don't have a spare, they have fifty protection factor, and we typically bring them out so that we can ensure protection. Okay, let's go back to the internet. And once again, I'm going to try to just rotate. I have a, a couple people asking a lot of questions, and I want to ask what I can from them, but some of the new people I'm going to try to move right. up. Um, on February 15, 2014, WIP did not detect radiation on workers or equipment, even though there was a release. What measures have been taken to improve the radiation detection equipment and worker training? So uh, I, I remember, uh, if you look at the consequence assessment document, the, the release I think uh, only spread one DPM per 100 square centimeters, right? So our release limit for clean area is 20 DPM per 100 square centimeters. So just because we couldn't detect anything on them, um, the, the instrumentation that we use, we're looking for 20 would be a clean area. So the release didn't create any kind of a contamination area on the surface or any hazard that way. Um, we did have some nuisance uh, uptakes. And again, all, the, uh, all those nuisance uptakes were less than the reportable 10 millirem over a 50-year period. And as that relates, remember, we all get 620 millirem a year just from living and breathing in the United States. So um, our instruments did work. The levels were just so low that it's, it's t basically a clean area. But it just takes a little bit of alpha to, uh, you know, when you're in the bioassay space, uh, the plus or minus uh, margin of error can cause you to go ahead and call it a positive and assign dose, even though there's uh, a statistical variation. Counting yeah, counting error in there. So, Walter, I know you've been improving training nonetheless. Could you talk about what you've been doing on that? Well, certainly, um, and not just me. I mean, we have a, a great training department. Um, right when I got here, they, we, we instituted RAD worker training, and everybody went through it, even people who were already trained. Um, we have uh, vastly improved our training for my radiological control technicians, going through all the job performance measures. Uh, we've revised pretty much every procedure at least twice. Um, so yeah, we've, it's been a continual improvement process and uh, we're going to make our program uh, not only compliant but world class and that's what we're benchmarking all the other DOE sites and uh, we're getting there. Do you want me to continue, Mr. Okay. Uh, if alpha radiation can be stopped by paper, why are the levels of PPE greater and smaller? Why are two sets of PPE needed? So we, we, we put you, because basic radio, radiation protection, we want to contain uh, contamination as close to the source as possible. So when we have people in high contamination areas, before we egress into an area of lower contamination, a lower posting area, we want to doff that set of PPE so we don't spread contamination. Um, and also, one of the biggest hazards of, of any kind of uh, spread of contamination or uptake is when you're doffing PPE, because you, you will take your respirator off, and if you have any uh, contamination on your PPE, it could be dislodged at that point. So when we're wearing doubles in a high contamination area, we're going to take it off and keep that contamination as close to the source as possible. And then as we egress out, uh, We'll, we'll make sure that, that they're, they continually get cleaner as we move towards the uh, RBA. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm sorry. Remember, the PPE is not to protect you from radiation. The PPE is to keep you from carrying contamination out with you. And that's why you have the double set. And this was a follow-up to that. When you clean the PPE or you wipe it down, do you wear PPE? as you're cleaning the other PPE? 
Yeah, so typically uh, when we come out of the uh, high contamination area, the rag contact does the wipe, they wipe each other down and, and we leave the, uh, the rags and everything there. Yeah, so we wipe it down in PPE, yes. Have there been any epidemiology studies of the bioassay assay data collected? And this is, I'm having trouble here. Data collected over the last 10 years, and if so, who is conducting that study? So would that be uh, CMERC or NMED type thing? I mean, uh, past 10 years bioassay data? Yeah, have there been any studies, and, and who's doing them using, using all this data? So we're, we're, again, the only uptakes that we had were, that I understand during that period was during the, uh, the event. Um, we did have a, a cesium uptake back in 2014, I believe. But other than that, it was a start clean, stay clean facility, so there were, there were no uptakes prior mm -hmm. to the event. In order to have an epidemiological study, you need to have a statistical basis. And I don't think we have have that level of statistics. We haven't had that many positive bioassays. If I can get out of that radiological rut we are in here for a moment. Um, the DOE uh, recently announced that uh, all bets are off on the schedule as far as uh, waste receipt uh, early next spring, that sort of thing. And one explanation that was given was that the schedule that had been developed late last year did not contain any contingencies or slack for unexpected things. Um, that seemed really odd to me because one of the primary rules of any project management is to put some contingencies into any schedule. Can you actually comment on whether that is true, that there was no contingency in there? And if there was no contingency, at the behest of whom were contingencies omitted from that schedule? So Norbert, you, you may know that I directed that the new baseline be developed and that it be done like I've done every other project in my life with a high confidence schedule where you break out all the activities, they're all tied together, and you evaluate risks for each activity. You build up that statistical base and you do a Monte Carlo analysis and you, you get your overall risk and where you need schedule contingency to have that level of confidence. Now, I have never in my career made any external commitments on a project without having that done. In this case, we um, were going into it with a drive for success. We had a goal that was given to us to try and meet, and that's what we were basing our schedule on to try and meet that goal that was publicized early on. Now, what we found is that because we had that goal that and there was so much publicity on that goal that our workforce started to believe that that goal was more important than safety. And that was so far from the truth. And that's what we had to correct by putting a new baseline in place that had the proper project management controls. Like, as I said, that I've done on every project in my career. Is this a follow-up, Norbert? Yeah, this is a follow-on to just dig a little deeper on that issue because I think it highlights a real problem out at WIP that apparently has still not been corrected. I think if somebody who has any knowledge of project management sees a schedule that has been developed and he sees no slack in it, and I have to fault myself actually, you had that seminar last week, when you, uh, last, last year when you talked about the schedule, and I did not notice at the time there was no slack and no contingency in there. But I'm reasonably sure that some people who are familiar with project management looked at that schedule and saw, where are contingencies in here? And either these people did not speak up at the time, or if they did speak up, they were 
not listened to apparently. And that I think leads to a deeper problem and that is we have had at WIP what led to those first two, two incidents that we had last year. We have had a culture basically of yes men that was induced years ago. And this experience now with the schedule that was published late last year and now the revision of the schedule demonstrates to me that apparently that culture is still not, has, has still not been corrected. Because if that culture had been corrected, then people, I think, should have started screaming late last year, what kind of a stupid schedule are you putting out here? There's no slack in there whatsoever. You're asking for trouble. Thanks, Dorbert. We'll, uh, we'll uh, go to Lauren now. We still have another one. I'm really interested in hearing an explanation of um, what's happening to all the um, contaminated debris, clothing, gloves, et cetera, the PPE or equipment that's contaminated that I guess, does it now have to be disposed of at WIP? So what WIP is producing now in terms of contaminated and, and how is that getting measured and is it enough to fill half a room, a room, a couple of containers? What are we talking about? Okay, so uh, yeah, we are uh, now have a low level waste program and we have to ship our waste off site. Um, we fill up, uh, you've seen a Sealand, a Connex container. Um, we fill up one of those maybe once a month or something, and we do ship it off. But all our, all, we, we go through a lot of PPE. As you can see, a lot, this takes up a lot of volume. Um, when we went through uh, and did our combustible control in the underground, we brought up a lot, of, a, a lot of trash. If it came from the south end of the mine, it was rad trash. The, the north end was clean trash. But we have generated a lot, and we do ship it off-site. Uh, we put it in Sealands here and send it to uh, EnviroCare in Utah. One more from the internet. Yeah, this is a follow-up. So let me this on, let me take this and, and um, a after we talked about the the gamma and the and the beta earlier in this pre um, discussion, uh, somebody went online and, and found some things they wanted to ask about. So um, plutonium two forty one decays into americium two forty one, which is an intense gamma emitter. How do you reconcile this information with saying that the concern is only alpha? So I think there's a misunderstanding. It's not an intense uh, gamma emitter. There is a, a low energy 59.5 keV gamma associated with uh, the alpha emission. Remember the alpha is uh, 5.49 MeV, which is a million electron volts. The gamma is 59.5 keV, which is 1,000 electron volts. So it's low energy. That's a very low energy gamma. Um, and it's just the atom de-exciting with a gamma emission after the alpha. So they need to go back to Wikipedia. They should look at cobalt 60 to see a high energy gamma. I, I think also uh, it's good to point out that americium-241 is the uh, radionuclide in every smoke detector sure. uh, that you have in your house, and uh, it doesn't get outside of the plastic container. And uh, the concentrations that they see uh, in the underground are low enough that, again, there's no measurable gamma from that low of a concentration. There's not enough to produce a dose rate. Okay, I've read some articles about <clears throat> green bursts that occurred uh, the night of this incident and that they had to call the electric company because they didn't know if there was something wrong with the substation. Now, supposedly, the americium, which is ionizing, and the plutonium comes out right next to that substation because that's where the exhaust, you know, they're very close to each other. So could that have, I mean, a lot of people were concerned that if more came out of there, that could have shut down the uh, No, I think the two are supply. unrelated. Um, the plume didn't, uh, I don't think the plume went over the substation. But it could have. Um, if the wind I, was I, wasn't, I wasn't here, but um, it'd be highly unlikely for uh, it to create any kind of a green glow. Yeah, that, that was identified early on and looked at and rolled out. And in fact, you'll see it um, addressed in the AIB report. Okay. okay. Any more, Kyle? Or are you? I think I'm All right. However, we might uh, wrap up a little early tonight. If we. Uh, 
Any, any other questions? If not, I would, uh, if you're interested and if you don't work with it every day, I'd, I'd uh, come up and, and look at the instrumentation, come up and look at the PPE. Um, and if you do work with it, you can, you can still come up and do that. Um, but we'd li like to thank everybody for coming and uh, I'll turn it over to Dana for a few last comments. Again, thank you for coming. Uh, I want to emphasize the WHIPS mission is really critical to the nation and, and that's why we are so focused and have been on recovering WHIP and not just getting into limited operation but going for full sustainable operation. That's, that's our real goal. So this will be my last town hall and um, the job as deputy manager here has uh, been one of the most challenging and and often rewarding jobs in my career and uh, so I'm gonna miss Carlsbad my wife and I have grown fond of, of Carlsbad but uh, we'll be moving back to the Pacific Northwest with uh, family and support and so uh, anyway thank you for coming and it's been a long difficult two years <laughs> Thanks, Dana. Thanks, Walt. Well, feel free to come up and move the equipment.